that means this votes for women just as the time has come when we may voice with free men concerns of land and home good morning good morning uh today we have a special presentation from linda Ratke in company with david gibson uh, linda is a retired english teacher and professional <laughs> singer with a particular interest in history she sings with Counterpoint, Vermont's professional vocal ensemble, and hosts the Vermont Public Radio Choral Hour. Accompanying Linda today is David Gibson, graduate of Immaculate College in Hollywood, California. And he's been working with Linda for how long, David? About uh, half of a year. Half, half of a year? Post-COVID. <laughs> Would you please welcome Linda Radke. Thank you. There's a wave of indignation rolling round and round the land, and its meaning is so mighty, and its mission is so grand, that non bonnets and cowards dare deny its just demands as we go marching on. Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? as we go marching on. Whence came your foolish notion, now so greatly overgrown, that a woman's sober judgment is not equal to your own? Has God ordained that suffrage is a gift to you alone, while we go marching on? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? as we go marching on. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for inviting me. I worked on this program a lot, and then COVID hit two years ago. And I know women's history is always relevant, but we celebrated the, the cent centennial of women's suffrage in 2020, and Vermont came a little late to the party, so we, we ratified the 19th Amendment in 1921. And here we are, and I'm really glad to be back. I think the last time I was here was 2011, and I was fighting the Civil War. It was the Vermont Civil War songbook, maybe for the raid, I can't remember exactly, but it was awesome. So I'm interested especially in how the women and men of the suffrage uh, movement made their point through the years, because you probably know the vote was not just given to women in 1920, it was hard earned, 72 years of act action. and. Uh, if you look at my costume, this is from 1920, the design. But when women first started, it was 1848 in the Seneca Falls Convention. So it would have been those big hoop skirts and the corsets. And so you can really see how the women began from the parlor, just talking about it among themselves, all the way to the polling place in those 72 years. Uh, I came from Seneca Falls, New York, which is in the Finger Lakes. And women's history was not a, a part of my upbringing at all. Uh, it wasn't really taught much in the schools. And I went back for my 50th reunion, and I went to the school to look at the old history textbook we had. They weren't using it anymore. It was in the book room. But I looked up women's suffrage and had one sentence. It said, 19, in 1920, well, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a New York State one. It was a national uh, textbook. In 1920, women were given the vote. <laughs> That's all they said. So. There are so many women and men who were suffragists. I put them in kind of a science fair uh, thing here. So at the end, I'll put on my mask and uh, please come up and ask your questions and tell your stories as well. I was interested in how women use music uh, to be make their point. And you probably have sung a lot of songs over the years that have political meaning. And what the first song demonstrates is, as Pete Seeger says, if the, core, if the audience already knows the, the, the music, your job is half done. Everybody knew Battle Hymn of the Republic. So over the years, many people put words to it. Um, there were 900 local, state, and national campaigns here in Vermont. Some of the women faced great support from their communities, uh, from their families. Other women, of course, were ostracized and shunned. And of course, later on during the flapper era, when it became sort of fashionable to be a suffragist, um, then they, they sort of gain some, some kind of fashion sense. But it's interesting to see how the things changed. 
So it's called From the Parlor to the Polling Place. I'll tell you about the beginning of the movement. Women started to meet together in their own parlors where it was uh, familiar territory, they felt safe. They started to talk about these things. And then their next step was um, to the church. Often the Methodist church would provide the, um, the basement when the heat was on during church services or prayer meetings. They could meet in the basement. Often, especially with the Methodist church, they were involved in abolition work or temperance work that was important. So those were social movements that were kind of allied. And then the next step, of course, was to the town hall. Women didn't have much experience in public speaking unless they were Quakers. And, and, and for Quakers, women were allowed to speak in public. So then after the church and the town hall, the next step was the state house in Montpelier. And by the end of the movement, we were going to Washington and marching in front of the White House and having protest rallies. So what I did is I went to the Vermont History Center and saw the agendas for all the suffrage meetings they had from 1883 all the way up to 1920. And they had annual meetings. And after 1920, when they achieved the vote, that same organization kind of transformed into the League of Women Voters, which we still have today. And when you look at it, it's so much fun. We were talking about, what's the cure, the spivies? These spivies cure? Sp there we go. I saw advertisements in these little old uh, agendas for all kinds of tonics. You know, and medicinals, and also there were ads for free fertilizer, you know. <laughs> and I could see that um, they got, the, you know, free wood and all that stuff. And then um, by the end, I could see the agenda started to stop with the praying and the Bible readings. But at the beginning, often, it was a religious song, it was a Bible reading, and then um, talking about the issues of the day. So I decided to dedicate every song to one of our suffragists. And this one is Clarina Howard Nichols. Mm. Here you go. Where's Clarina? Hmm. She's got to be here. <laughs> oh, maybe she's down here. She uh, was um, a journalist from Brattleboro and had an abusive marriage, so she left that and came to Montpelier. She was the first woman to speak at the State House in Montpelier. And that was early, 1852. And uh, what she was advocating was not national suffrage. She said women should be able to vote in municipal uh, vote, uh, contests, certainly for the school board, for the library, for things like that. And also she wanted to extend women's custodial rights, because at that time the children belonged to the husband, should the marriage fail. So up in Lamoille County, there's a, a women's center there called the Clarina Howard Nichols Center. This is from really early days. Uh, it sounds like Gilbert and Sullivan to us, I think, a little bit. And I think it was probably sung just in the parlor because the words are a little bit strident about men. <laughs> and this one was published with a picture of a woman on front, beautiful woman, and it said, as sung by Mrs. Charles Wood. And that's the other thing I noticed, that women didn't really have names. <laughs> so you have to do a little bit of digging for that. Often it's in initials for their names. And uh, this basically doesn't talk about voting. It's just talking up for women to have a right, uh, to have a voice in their domestic life. Mentalist is fit for wives to submit to their husbands submissively weakly. And whatever they say, their wives should obey unquestioning stupidly meekly. Our husbands would force us our own dictum take without ever a wherefore or why for it. But I don't, and I can't, and I won't, and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. It's all fudge to say man's the best judge of what should be and shouldn't and so on. That woman should bow nor attempt to say how she considers the matter to go on. I never yet gave up myself thus a slave, however my husband might try for it. For I don't and I can't and I won't and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. I hope who for the husbands to cope with the rights of the sex will not trifle. We all, if we choose our tongues but to use, can all opposition soon stifle. Let man, if he will, then bid us be still and silent, a price he'll pay high for it. 
for we won't and we can't and we don't and we shan't. Let us all speak our minds if we die for it. I think a lot of the time when we're trying to change somebody's mind, it's a mistake to be too strident or too angry at first, and to, especially for women who had no power at all in the society. They used humor really effectively, and it was gentle humor, and then as the years and decades went on, of course, it got a little more pointed. So uh, in Seneca Falls in 1848, voting was not part of the Declaration of Women's Rights. And uh, it was Frederick Douglass, the black abolitionist from Rochester, who urged Elizabeth Cady Stanton to put that at the end. And um, Lucretia Mott, who was one of the early suffragists also, and a Quaker, said, oh, Lizzie, thou, would make, thou wouldst make us look ridiculous if we asked for a vote. So it was really early. So one of the emotional appeals they used was the idea that many women are mothers, and it was an expected role that women had. That was women's sphere in the family. And so the, both the anti-suffrage people and the pro-suffrage people used that idea of mothers and respect for mothers in different ways. Like, how can we insult our mother by telling her she's not fit to be a citizen? So this is a tune, again, they're using a, a, a familiar tune because people could sing along with it, and you'll recognize it, I think. It was sung at rallies during the Civil War. It's called Giving the Ballot to the Mothers. Bring the good old bugle, boys, we'll sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that will start the cause along. Sing it as we ought to sing it, cheerily and strong. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Jubilee, hurrah, hurrah, our spirits shall be free. So we sing this chorus from the mountains to the sea, giving the ballot to the mothers. Bring the dear old Buke banner boys and fling it to the wind. Mothers, wives, and daughters, let it shelter and defend. Equal rights, our motto is we're loyal to the end. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, our spirits shall be free. So we'll sing this chorus from the mountains to the sea. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Thank you. I know there are a lot of there's a lot of Civil War interest here in St. Albans. Does anybody recognize the tune? No, it was sung at General Sherman's funeral, so it was a Union song called "Marching Through Georgia." At the end of the campaign for women's rights, the final state to ratify the 19th Amendment was not Vermont; it turned out to be Tennessee. So obviously they were going to use that song there. So by the end, you'll find more Confederate tunes being used to suffrage songs. So women continued to petition the state house and have these yearly conventions. Sometimes people would come in, famous suffragists would come in to help us drum up support. And every year they would go and speak. And sometimes the Senate would say yes, and the legislature would say no. And the next year it was flipped, and the next year it was flipped. I think they were playing a game here. I think they were sort of listening to them, but not really committing to that. Because there were a lot of interests in the state at that time, especially the liquor industry and the factories, who knew that once women were voting, there might be laws to protect child labor, for example, or working conditions, or maybe even protecting women. So at the end, they finally had the votes from both sides of the, in the state house. But we had a governor at the time, Percival Clement, who was an anti-suffrage man, very strongly um, the lobby for the liquor interest, in, interest at the time, and he knew that prohibition would be death to that industry. So he vetoed it. He refused to hold a special session. So we didn't get it until the next year when the feds told us we had to. But um, there was a lot of disruption during that time. And then by 1921, a little bit of karma happened because women were able to vote uh, because of the 19th Amendment. And Governor Clement didn't do so well. <laughs> and so the man, man who ended, the Republican who ended up being governor is right here, 
and his name was James Hartness. He was an industrialist from the Springfield area, pro-suffrage. We just learned, I learned from somebody there that he wanted women to work in the factories and he provided them with rooms so they could change into their work clothes. And guess what? He paid them the same as the men at the machines, which is pretty amazing for, the, for 1920. So I'm going to dedicate this next song to James Hartness. Oh, and by the way, suffragettes, you probably know this. That's a British term. Um, when they came to the United States, there were so many men that were supporting the, the, the cause. They either came through the uh, temperance movement or something else, just felt like it was morally right for them to do that. And so they didn't want to call them suffragettes. And they started calling them suffragents <laughs> for a while. And now we use the word suffragists, which is not pejorative at all. So this is a comic song from 1885. Uh, the composer is Mrs. M. W. C. Slade, who knows, and Mrs. A. B. Smith. And what they suggest in this song, very gently, is that if a man doesn't want to support women's suffrage, it's coming. And so he's going to be sorry that he wasn't on the right side when that happens. And obviously, Governor Clements was not. So I put uh, James Hartness on the honor roll. And uh, I have to play both parts. So there's a man and a woman arguing. It's a vaudeville tune. I'm the guy now. I've been down to Boston, boys, to see the folks and sights. Dear me, I heard such fuss and noise about these women's rights. Now it's as plain as my old coat, it's plain as plain can be, that when the women want the vote, they'll get no help from me. Not from Joe, not from Joe, and he know it. Not from Joseph, no, no, no. Not from Joe, not from me, I'll tell you no. Now I'm the girl. Joseph, tell us something new. We're tired of that old song. We'll sew your seams and cook your meals. To vote won't take us long. We will help clean house. The one too large for man to clean alone. The state and nation, don't you see, when we the vote have won? Yes, we will, and you'll help. For you'll need our help, friend Joseph. Yes, you will, when we're in. So you better help us win. You're just right, how blind of then I ne'er had seen it thus. Tis true the taxes you must pay without a word of fuss. You are subject to the laws men make, but not no word or note. Can you sing out when it will count? I'll help you win the vote. Yes, I will. Thank you, Joe. Soon together we'll be voters. Yes, we will. If you'll all vote yes at the polls next fall. Thank you. That was a very successful argument in Vermont, which is the idea of taxes. Everybody grows up with that understanding about taxation without representation. So it also hit us where we, we count. We, you know, originally, it was property owning, owning white men who could vote, and that started to open up a little bit. Women at that point could own property. They could inherit property. Some of them were running businesses as well. So this is a patriotic tune that you'll recognize. And I want to ded dedicate it to a woman from Grafton. And she's over here. It's Miss Lucy Daniels. Again, not marrying also helped her to keep hold of her property. She owned quite a bit of property in Grafton, had a big farm. And uh, she decided not to pay her property taxes one year because she couldn't vote. And this was like 1915. This was late, and she was tired of it. And so the, the town fathers, the select men, uh, seized some of her property. And so she went uh, to Washington, D.C. She, was, uh, she was imprisoned. She wasn't tortured there with, with force feeding, but she was in prison and uh, picketed the White House. Nobody did it back then. Nobody held signs in front of the White House. So when she went back home, she was a pariah. I mean, not so much now. They put up a sign in Grafton. They're really proud of her. But at that point, nobody would talk to her. They wrote nasty things on her barn. But she, she would go around the town and she would give every little girl 50 cents, which was a lot in 1915, and say, I want you to attend town meeting because you need to know how these things work because probably by the time you're an adult, you will vote. So here it is. This is Uncle Sam's wedding. And I love the covers of the sheet music. And this shows a, a woman in white arm in arm with Uncle Sam. You know the song? 
songs that have been sung within the states and nation. There's none that comes so near my heart as Uncle Sam's relation. Yankee Doodle is his name, U.S. his honored station. Red and white and starry blue, his garb on each occasion. When Uncle Sam set up his house, he welcomed every brother. But in the haste of his new life, he quite forgot his mother. Now his house is up in arms, a housewife he must find him. The sweep and dust and set to right, the tangles all around him. Uncle Sam is long in years and he is growing wiser. He can say twas a mistake to have no misadviser. His nephews now have got the reins and looking o'er their shoulder. Shout to dear old Uncle Sam goodbye, old man forever. Now we're here, dear Uncle Sam, to help you in your trouble. And the first thing best to do is making you a double. Yankee Doodle will be glad to join in us in spreading the news about of all the land of Uncle Sam's great wedding. So you notice that part where they said, we will still have your house clean. We will have dinner on the table. It doesn't take long, on, us long to vote. That was their argument at that point. Give me 20 minutes and I can vote. But I think that the bigger argument was what they called enlarged housekeeping. And this was a brilliant strategy because since women's sphere was the idea that we're the domestic goddesses, we are the angel at the hearth, we take care of the spiritual life of the family, we make sure they have clean food and good clothes and a safe environment. So that's the sphere of women. And they said, we're not asking to become men. We're not complaining that this is not our sphere. We're saying, let's enlarge our sphere to include the greater community to help clean up all the messes that men have made <laughs> of our town. Really, that's what they were doing. And they had this idea that we know now, now is not true, but the idea that we are superhero housekeepers. We will go in there. We will clean that up. Not only that, but we will all vote the same, and so there will be no more war because we are the mothers, after all. So there was that idea that, that women were higher than men spiritually, and so that was a good thing in government. And there was an assumption, I think, that we would all vote as a block. But there was a problem when women went beyond their usual sphere because they saw women and families who were suffering because they didn't have access to clean water, air, schools, education. So Jane Addams and other suffragists said, let's look at those uh, conditions and get money to help these poor people. This is before we had any really federal support for people who were struggling. And if you didn't have a church community or a family, you were really on the street. So I want to dedicate this to a local lady, a real hero. I put her right in the middle, Aunt Annette Parmerly. And she, she's got these little glasses. She looks like a school teacher. She was fierce. She was such an activist. She and her husband lived in Enosburg Falls. And there's a, a t apparently, there's a plaque up now. And they were Methodists, very strong in temperance work, in abolition work. And so she and her husband worked together to uh, help women get the rights at least to vote in local um, elections. She wasn't going for the federal elections either, but she said, when there's a board for any place that women are, the so-called poor houses, I don't know if St. Albans had a poor house or a work farm, uh, certainly what we called the insane asylums back then, like in Waterbury, they said there should always be a woman on the board. But Annette was smart. They called her Annette the Hornet. She never gave up, but also she knew that humor can probably get a little bit more help than being bitter and acerbic all the time. So there's one broadside that she had that said, come to, I think it was Milton, come to Milton, we're having a rally, should men have the vote? <laughs> and so she had this, these things, but I, well, I don't know because men, they're awfully emotional. You know, when, when you see them at a sporting event, they're just out of control. And women are skilled negotiators. They have to do that to live their lives. When men are faced with a conflict, violence is the only way they can think of to fix it. <laughs> but what I love about this next song, talking about Annette, is that they start to talk about the factory conditions at the time. And they say, the, the lyrics say, the joyless haunt of drudges where children toil and dar die. So I think that's where things got, people got nervous about that because they knew that they were gonna go in and change the factory conditions. So here we go, it's called 
the votes for women. What means this votes for women? Just this the time has come when we may voice with free men concerns of land and home. Then snap the ancient tether, enthralling us too long, and stoutly pull together to right a grievous wrong. Shout the song of votes for women, ring it out upon the air. Here it's no cheap hatred, free men, who the right will dare. cause grows bigger and the woman's day draws nigh. The votes of sisters, mothers in every sovereign state for us and many others light a gloom of fate. The joyless haunts of drudges where children toil and die may find these votes the judges that ask the reason why. Shout the song of votes for women, bring it out upon the air. Hear the vote the patriot freemen, who the right will dare sing. Along with lusty vigor, till it matches earth and sky. That the woman's cause grows bigger, and the woman's day draws nigh. The lady who made my costume, we had so much fun researching designs. She said one, one of the effects of these public marches, which was the next step in their battle, was that the hemlines went up. So your hoof skirts were dragging in the mud. Now that we're in mud season, we think about that. And that was a, a real hard thing for women to do, to go up in public and, right, and march down the middle of the road, sometimes silently, in white, just asking for be, the rights of a citizen. And when in Milton, this is another great story from one of the papers, I think it was the messenger here, and I just have a little photocopy about it, and it's in the women's column. Do you remember they had a women's column? And I told a young person the other day that they had help wanted women and men, and he didn't believe me. <laughs> no waiter or waitress. So um, they went to the, the polls, and the beginning of the article talks about what every woman was wearing because women dressed up for this thing. They wanted to be taken seriously, and that meant the hats, whenever you see them, they really dressed up. So they all dressed up, and the article said the oldest was 83, the youngest was 22, they went on and on. And then they say, there was a protest by Mrs. Raleigh and Mrs. Robinson that the, the voters, the women, were given pencils to fill out their vote, their ballot. And I thought, I don't understand that, because we use pencils. And I think what it is that men might have had their fountain pens, they might have had pockets, and if possible, they gave women pencils, and they hadn't voted before, so they had no confidence that those votes wouldn't be erased by the city fathers who were collecting the ballots. So it's interesting now, because we talk a lot about that, of course, in, in elections. But for them, this is the first time, and there needed to be some trust. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the church as well, because there was a real rift in the community. As I said, it grew up from mostly the Protestant churches, and often the ministers were sympathetic and they marched with the women, and they could meet in the church basement. They always sang. But um, there was also this debate whether or not the church was helping or hurting women in their right for equality. So I'll talk about that a little bit later with uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who is from my hometown of Seneca Falls, who was a radical. And she thought actually the church, well, not the church, but yeah, the church of the Bible was hurting the quest for uh, equality. This is a song that was sung around picnic tables in California because they had a prohibition uh, against public speaking by women. And so they ate coffee and donuts, and the police were there. They gave the police the coffee and donuts. And uh, they had this song, 1911. So actually, the West had the vote early for women. And we can't find the music. And, and rather than finding the music or making up something, here's the poem I wanted to read to you. There is no realm on earth's domain amongst birds, nor beasts, nor bees, where such unequal code doth reign as that which man decrees. Who holds that women have no part nor place in council grave? Who hold that men alone are smart and pure and wise and brave? 
thou relic of a bygone age, shall we thy truth admit? Shall never man turn o'er the page on which was error writ? Shall we ne'er waken from the night we dwelt in cave and tree when simple force of might made right, when women mute must be? Twas said not many years ago by men wise and discreet that women had no souls, you know, but only hands and feet. <laughs> These days we've souls that some relief, but still the fact remains, according to man's best belief, we are sadly short of brains. <laughs> Day follows night, and darkness flees, and dawn of justice reigns. When inequality shall cease, and counsel all may share, why should not woman work with man to speed the coming day when shall become, in fact, the plan that God hath had always. So the idea of using the rhetoric of the Christian church here, and also in this next song, using a familiar hymn to set up echoes that this is really God's plan, that we should all be equal under God. And it was performed all over New England. There was a famous uh, reform band, the Pudge Hutchinson family, they were superstars. And they used arguments from the scriptures. And so this one, I want you to think about the nation's centennial. So we're talking about 1876. It's in Philadelphia. The Hutchinson family is there. And this progressive era is beginning. And they're um, looking a century ahead to the bicentennial, to 1976, when the utopia will happen, when this will be a perfect place. And I love that spirit of utopianism in this next song. And it's to a familiar hymn, as I said. It's called 100 Years Hence. And I'm going to dedicate this, and her picture is right here. My grandma was uh, Minnie Clemens, and I'm, I'm wearing her jewelry. And she voted for the first time in 1920 at the age of 30. So here's hymn time. <laughs> Some of you know what I think. 100 years hence, what a change will be made in politics, morals, religion, and trade. In statesmen who wrangle or ride on the fence, these things will be altered 100 years hence. Our laws then will be uncompulsory rules, our prisons converted to national schools. The pleasure of sinning, it's all a pretense, and so we will find it 100 years hence. Oppression and war will be heard of no more, nor the blood of a slave leave his prince on our shore. Conventions will then be a useless expense, for we'll all go free suffrage 100 years hence. Instead of sea speech making to satisfy wrong, all will join the glad chorus to sing freedom's song. And if the millennium is not a pretense, we'll all be good neighbors 100 years hence. And there are a lot of those kind of songs that you could just sing because you knew the tune already. And uh, I was going to tell you about Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She's my next dedicatee because she looked, well, I, I have two pictures. One is her as a young mother with her daughter Harriet and the other as a, an older woman. She couldn't travel. She had seven children in Seneca Falls. So while Susan B. Anthony had to go all around the country, she was the writer. She had this amazing legal mind. And the problem with the three of them, with Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, and um, Katie. Thank you, Elizabeth Katie Stanton, uh, is that Katie Stanton kept on going farther than they wanted to go. And at one point, she wrote something called the Woman's Bible, which I've read. And she takes the point that the Bible, reading the Bible, leads to the oppression of women. And you can find lots of evidence there. You can find evidence the other side. And so. The 19th century reformers said, Lizzie, hold back. <laughs> We're not ready for that because if we make all the religious people angry, we've lost our whole movement. But she went really far. She actually never got to, got to vote. She died in 1902 at the age of 86. And <laughs> when I was growing up, that picture, it's got, she's wearing a cross, was our uh, elementary school was named for Katie Stanton. And her picture was there in the hallway. I never knew who she was. I walked by that, that every time we called her Mrs. Claus. 
<laughs> so this next song is dedicated to her. And uh, it's basically talking about something that Elizabeth Cady Stanton talked about a lot, is why can't women vote, especially women who are educated, and as she called them, moral. And she pointed to undesirable voters. And she took, there, there's a big net there about immigrants. And that's the unfortunate thing about reading from the early suffragists. But they decided that to point out drunkenness was a, a valuable strategy because, again, um, the, the idea that all the Irish are drunks all the time, that, that became part of the songs and the, and the rhetoric that how come these men can vote or men that get paid for their vote or men who can't read. You know, and here I went to Vassar College, why, why I'm, not, I'm not suitable. So this is one uh, talking about the drunkards and the wastrels, really, who get the vote, whereas the, the moral woman cannot. And I think you'll recognize this, too. It's a, it's a Scottish tune. If the men should see the women going to the polls, to put down your liquor traffic, need it vex their souls. If we're angels as they tell us, can we once suppose that all the men will frown on us when going to the polls? We love our boys, our household joys, we love our girls as well. The love, love is from above, it's that we ne'er rebel. No discharge have Christian women from the war with sin. At the polls with Gog and Magog must our fight begin. Since we Bible marching orders needed fright our souls, though all the men should frown on us when going to the polls. We love our boys, our household joys, we love our girls as well. The love of love we cannot tell that we ne'er rebel. <laughs> so that's the uncomfortable part of this history. And luckily, people have been doing a lot of research about the racism and the xenophobia that happened right along with this argument. They wanted educated suffrage. They wanted people who could read and write English. So that, of course, restricted former slaves and um, immigrants. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton called them the steerage, and he, she used worse words as well. And Annette Parmerly from Innsbruck uh, published arguments for women's suffrage, and one of them was practical. If you give native, she called them native-born women, but she wasn't talking about Native Americans. If you give native-born white women the vote, there are twice as many as the foreign-born men and women. So that will increase the rep representation of those born here who are white. So it's hard to read that, but her daughter Harriet took her on because her daughter went to the tenements in New York City to try to get support through the unions for women's voting. It made sense. And she said that we need to go in and talk to these people who aren't of our class and show them how that's really important and fight against some cultural differences with the people who are coming over that said that women have no place in that. So. Um, that was the uncomfortable part, and a lot of fighting happened because of that. And certainly, um, when the amendment was passed to give black men the vote, it was a horrible rift in the whole thing, because the women had helped men with the abolition movement. Men got the vote. People like Frederick Douglass said, just be patient. The country can't handle two major upheavals at once. Let's give the black men the vote, because it's going to be, you know, and then let's work, work on it with women. Of course, we know how long that took. So a lot of white suffragists kind of betrayed their black sisters um, by focusing on, on their own needs. So there was a suffragist who was black, uh, Frances Harper, and she said, white women are speaking of rights, I speak here of wrongs. If there are any class of people who need to be lifted out of their airy nothingness and selfishness, it is the white women of America. So there's a lot of difficulty about that. A lot of women, of course, now we know black women are so pivotal in our elections, but back then also, founders of the NAACP and this woman, Ida B. Wells, who is here, she was uh, an Illinois suffragist, but the suffragists didn't want her to march in, in Washington, D.C. Wa they wanted her to go to the back with the, the black people. 
And so what she did, Ida B, is she stood on the curb, and the minute the Illinois de delegation went by, she just stepped in and just kept on marching. I love that. So that was a, that was a rift that was a, a horrible, horrible, hard to read stuff that didn't come out, I think, until these past couple of years. So here's another one that's another Bobby Burns song. I'll dedicate to, oh, let's see, Ida B. Wells. I have a neighbor, one of those not very hard to find, who knows it all without debate and never change his mind. I asked him what of women's rights, he said in tone severe, my mind on that is all made up, keep woman in her sphere. I saw a man in tattered garb forth from the pub house come. He squandered all his cash for drink and starved his wife at home. I asked him, should not women vote? He answered with a sneer. I've taught my wife to know her place, keep woman in her sphere. I met an earnest, thoughtful man not many days ago that pondered deep all human love, the honest truth to know. I asked him what of women's cause, his answer came severe. Her rights are just the same as mine, let woman choose her sphere. And that was another time when Lizzie Clayton Stanley was shocking to people because she suggested at the time that maternity could be voluntary. That women could actually choose whether to have children or not. This is long before Margaret Sanger. So again, it was like, <laughs> So that kind of d debate, how radical do we want to be? And we've certainly seen that in a lot of protest movements and some, some rifts. But the fact is that early suffragists had the money, had the time, maybe had household help, they were pretty much upper class or upper middle class white women who started going out in public and doing these things. Later on, of course, the, the tent got bigger, but not without a lot of struggle. So this next one is probably the only time Yiddish is sung in the space, I don't know. And it has to do with the work that women suffrage workers did in New York City in the tenements. That's why New York State had the vote a lot longer than Vermont, because they started um, printing their brochures in the languages of the people. So uh, Yiddish, German, Italian, everything. And they would start to speak on street corners and certainly work with the unions. And this is uh, one I'm going to dedicate to Ernestine Rose. And she's somewhere. There she is, to the right of um, Mrs. Parmerly. She was a rabbi's daughter born in Poland and uh, came to America by herself and worked for temperance and for abolition. But then she realized that uh, there wasn't a whole lot of religious tolerance. She was Jewish. And she also worked for the rights of married women, again, not to, to be able to manage their own money, to maybe own property, to have a voice. But the problem in the movement was when Ernestine started to come here, uh, she declared she was an atheist. And again, the religious connection to this, uh, this movement was very strong. And so it was hard for her. And here is a song. It's a comic song from the Yiddish theater in New York, and it's by De Bessie Tomaszewski. She was a, a, the queen of Yiddish theater, and uh, she and her husband moved to Hollywood and had a big career in vaudeville and other things. Um, her grandson is still alive. His name is Michael Tilson Thomas. He's a composer, a conductor. They changed their name from Tomaszewski. So it, it's in Yiddish. I got some help from Avram Pat, who's a legislator who grew up in a, what do you call himself, a pink diaper bed, uh, home like a communist home in New York City where they spoke Yiddish. And so here it is. The time will come, ladies, when women will be equal to men. We'll have all the power that men will hold. We'll have the right to come home in the middle of the night, dead drunk, from the saloon, and we'll no longer work like slaves. And what's more, the men will have our babies for us so we can keep our <laughs> flat tummies. Also, elections will only be in our hands. The president will kiss every woman 300 times, and also will be the police. So we'll have two or three women on the corner, and when a thief is caught, 
He'll just give us a kiss and he'll be free. Anybody here know Yiddish? You can help me later because I, I grew up in a German, German speaking home, so I'm, I, they tell me that it sounds a lot like German, but I'm trying. Sprengt jetzt heraus die Zeit, ich denk's es nicht, dass euch schlägt. Die Farbe wären kein Gleich mit Leid, sie kämpfen, sie hoben viel Recht. Verschiedene Frauen für allerlei Rassen, Zähne, Pläne aus Pläne. Die Läufe der Männer, Mensch, spitz in die Gassen, der Drachen, er schreit mit die Männer. In sie schreien, prüft nur Treuen, wendet mit, dann dann bereit. began as a very genteel movement, ladies meeting in parlors, and then it got broader and broader. And here in Vermont, there was a lady, a very rich lady named Electra Havemeyer Webb, that he'd been to Shelburne. And she was the mother. I'm sorry, this was Louise, Louisine Havemeyer. And of course, she was a great art collector. She got arrested. And what she did, oh my goodness, she tried to burn an effigy of President Wilson <laughs> during a war, <laughs> World War I. Because the National Women's Party later on was really tired of being genteel. And so they fought hard. Alice Paul is the, the leader of that. So again, a, a rift in the thing, the, the ladies saying we must work within the system, and others saying we're going to have to shake things up a little bit more. And so they did. And they're marching up Fifth Avenue of 3,000 women and an audience of 10,000. 1912, 10,000 marchers. Can you imagine? They didn't have access to any other media. And then the next one was right before Wilson's inauguration. And it kind of took the, the stage from him coming in the train. And they had 20, two, 20, 250,000 onlookers. And there was violence that day. There was a mob. Um, this is the one where Ida B joined the thing. But um, what the suffragists did, the men, was they would sort of flank the women because there were a lot of people just throwing things at them. And they had a lot of allies from that. And uh, Wilson was a southerner. Um, he was a conservative, states' rights man. So he basically told women, be patient. But then what happened is during World War I, women's service during that war really raised the idea that we are indeed citizens and we're fighting for democracy with you. So he finally agreed to the suffrage amendment. And then 20 million potential votes, of course, came up too. But a lot of people said they've crossed the line, you know, and, and that, for example, bearing the effigy. At one point, they said uh, they, they had a sign up that said Kaiser Wilson. Like, why are you fighting for democracy in Europe when there's no democracy at home? And a lot of people felt that women were starting to lose their sexual appeal. And there's a wonderful cartoon here which shows the early suffragists that have warts and you know, like no man would ever want them kind of ladies. <laughs> and then by 1920, their hat, hat, they're very stylish. So it's interesting to see how the image of the suffragist changed. So. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll dedicate this one to Alice Paul, because she uh, spoke at my church in Seneca Falls in 1920 uh, about suffrage, of course, but she was the first to uh, bring up the Equal Rights Amendment, which, of course, it hasn't been passed. And she had a banner in Tennessee, and she'd sew on a new star every time uh, a state ratified the 19th Amendment. And uh, it did in August 1920. And uh, one other person to dedicate this to, besides Alice Paul, is from Seneca Falls. There was one woman in 1848 who signed that petition who ended up voting, only one. And her name was uh, Charlotte Woodward. She was a 19-year-old who came in from Gloversville, New York. She made gloves. She was a Quaker. And at the end of her life, she ended up being in Philadelphia, being sort of an activist as well. She was 91 years old by the time she got to vote. So here is the, basically, it's a Confederate tune, because as I said, the final battle was in Tennessee. And uh, I'll ask you to sing along with me on the chorus. There 
is a band of women and to a manner born, emerging from the darkness past and looking toward the morn. Their mothers labored, waited for a night without a star. The morning shows the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah for equal rights, hurrah, hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. This band is all reforming, war shall be at an end. Bayonets and swords shall rust, we'll use the brain, the pen. Laden with precious freight now, thunders our progress car. The headlight waves a suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. Ready? Hurrah, hurrah for equal rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. One more time. Hurrah, hurrah for equal rights, hurrah, hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. Thank you. <laughs> We're at the 14th Star Brewery. How do you like that? <laughs> so that was November 2nd, 2020. 10 million women voted. So that was one third of those eligible. And three women for every five men voted including, these are really undesirable voters, right? Eleanor Roosevelt vote for the, voted for the first time. She was not for women's suffrage for a lot of reasons, but she voted. The first lady, Edith Wilson, voted, and of course my grandmother. And in Vermont, first time voters were 10,000, getting rid of Governor Clement. <laughs> and I have to say though, Native Americans were left out. There was a court case in 1948, and the final uh, holdout was Utah, and they, Native Americans finally got the vote in 1962. And also uh, Chinese Americans, 1946. And of course, the sad history, the Japanese Americans finally got it in 1952. And of course, lots of barriers today to everyone voting. And as they say, hard won, not done. But by the date of this costume, 1920, the songs have changed. So this is gonna be my last song. And it really comes from that, um, Oh, Tin Pan Alley kind of feeling. I think I have the cover here. And it uh, was the same company that, that uh, Gershwin worked for. So you can hear that little echoes of, of jazz in here. And uh, in the early days, remember they had one about mother, how you shouldn't insult your mother? This one uses mother too, the idea that women are somehow pure and gentler. And so if women get the vote, our country will improve. And this has the best title. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with you. <laughs> no man is greater than his mother. No man is half so good. Than the wife he loves. Her love will guide him, whate'er betide him. She's good enough to love you and adore you. She's good enough to bear your troubles for you. And if your tears were falling today, nobody else would kiss them away. She's good enough to warm your heart with kisses when you're all lonesome and blue. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with you. Men plunged our world in war and sadness. We must protest in vain. Let's hope and pray someday we'll hear her say, Stop all your madness, we bring you gladness. She's good enough to love you and adore you. She's good enough to bear your troubles for you. And if your tears were falling today, nobody else will kiss them away. She's good enough to warm your heart with kisses when you are lonesome and blue. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with you.
Cecilia, thank you. Thank you, and I've got one more song because, as Pete Seeger says, the concert ain't over until the audience sings. <laughs> and you know the tune, but I had so many ver uh, verses that I loved of the battle hymn through the years. And so I've had to pick two wonderful um, verses for this time. And all you have to remember is glory, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> It's the right of every woman. <clears throat> Ooh. He's good, isn't he? <coughs> it's the right of every woman to mark out her path in life and to be a saint or soldier or a true and loving wife, to fill your soul with gladness and recall the world from strife. to cheer her nation in its every hour of need, a right to sit in judgment on her country's faith and creed. Like man to cast her ballot, I'm sorry, sorry, and show the world her courage by some high heroic deed as she goes marching. It's her right to train her children in the home and in the school, to help in framing statutes and determine who shall rule, and like men, to cast her ballot for a statesman or a fool as she goes. Thank you, John. And Linda, again, thank you, and David. Thank you. We certainly appreciate your coming. Thank you, and I'll be right up here. I hope you can come up and share your stories. Yes, thank, thank you. you.